hard to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to accident investigation, hit and run detail. You receive a call that two elderly women have been struck down in a crosswalk by a hit and run driver. The women lie in Georgia Street Hospital. Their condition is critical. Your job? Find the driver. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild. Superbly blended to give you Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect Fatima cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow Fatima package. So compare Fatima yourself today. You'll find Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Yes, light up a Fatima. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, September 5th. It was mild in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of accident investigation, hit and run detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Benny Caldwell, chief of traffic. My name's Friday. It was 7.35 p.m. when I got to 4656 Collis Avenue. My front door. Is that your chair, sir? Yeah, Ma. Got both Sunday papers. Oh, good. It's nice music on the radio, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty. It's your favorite song, isn't it? Yes. See you in my dreams. Every Saturday night, we used to get together down at the old Cromwell house on West Adams Boulevard. Weekly dance, you know. Yeah, I know. It was a lovely old home down there. Had a beautiful ballroom upstairs. Always had a good time at the Cromwell house. Was that before you were married? Oh, my, yes. Met your father through Mildred Cromwell, you know. She was quite fond of him, too. Is that so? Yes, she was. Oh, nothing was serious, but she used to think quite a lot of that. And you broke him up, huh? Now, Joseph, you know I wouldn't do a thing like that. If Millie was only mildly interested in Sam, I wouldn't come between two people that were happy. You know that. Well, that isn't the way he used to tell it. Said you just broke him up, that's all. Yes. Well. He ever tell you about the time all the girls invited some of the fellows from the Royal Order of the Western Wildlife Protective Brotherhood, Southern Charter, over to the basket raffle? To a what? Basket raffle. All the girls packed tasty lunches, and the boys bid for them at auction. Oh, yeah. It was a warm summer evening, just like tonight. It was a grand affair. Annie Shellman was there with Jim Donahoe, and your father came with Lorenzo Fisher, the grand vizier of the wildlifers. Yeah, sounds like quite an evening. Oh, it was, Joseph. It really was. Samuel bid the highest for my basket. Ten dollars and fifteen cents. I'll always think to this day that's the reason Millie Cromwell's been so cool toward me. Oh, yeah, could be. You want part of the examiner, Ma? Oh, thank you, son. I'm going to finish turning this collar on your shirt. Okay. You wouldn't think a basket lunch could come between two good friends, would you? A big fine? What's that? Who'd ever think a basket lunch should break up a friendship like Millie Cromwell's and mine? No, ma'am, you wouldn't. I'll get it, Ma. Oh, 
Friday talking. This is McDermott, Joe. Oh, yeah, Mac. Got a bad one. Two elderly women were struck by a hit and run. Well, just a minute, Mac. I can't. Hit. Hey, Ma, would you turn down the radio, please? You're all right. Thank you. Yeah, Mac, go ahead. Three blocks west the Riverside on Los Feliz. We have two traffic cars out there now for the preliminary investigation. You and Romero better roll on it. Right, Mac, right away. I've already notified Romero. He's on his way over to pick you up now. Okay, I'll be ready. Keep me informed, huh? Right, Mac, bye. Did you have to go back to work, Joe? Yeah, where'd you put my flashlight, do you remember? It's right here in the desk. Okay, thank you. What is it, son, an accident? Yeah, a bad one, it sounds like. Hit and run. Who was it, did they say? A couple of elderly women struck down up on Las Palos. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, Ma, they're all terrible. Ten minutes after I hung up the phone, Ben arrived, and at 8.10 p.m., we got to the intersection of Los Feliz Boulevard and Commonwealth Avenue. The bodies of the two victims had been removed and taken to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. One of the uniformed officers was taking photographs of the scene. His partner was picking up particles of glass and all physical evidence left by the hit-and-run driver. He identified himself as Officer E.W. Hyde, Unit 61T. Few pieces of the headlight lens and the chrome ring, about all. And this is the point of impact, huh? Hmm? Yeah, that's right. It's 24 feet south of the northerly pavement and about 12 feet east of the westerly curb line. Right in the crosswalk up there, huh? Yeah. And freshly painted, the driver couldn't miss seeing it. Could yeah, it's well illuminated, good street lighting up here. Hide were the signals in operation. No, they weren't. Boulevard stopped here, though. Blinkers are all in operation. How far were the bodies of the victims thrown? Body number one was thrown 70 feet. Body number two was knocked 38 feet in the southwest direction. Both came to rest approximately at the center line of the street. Mm. Whoever did it was going at a high rate of speed. That's what we figured. I told you there were no skid marks, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Any witnesses? Yeah, there's three, but only one I think will be helpful. What's the name and address? He's right over there on the curb now. The name's Richard Morgan. Runs a the nursery there. Well, thanks, Hyde. You're going to make the reports and book the evidence, are you? Yeah, I'll take care of it. That's Morgan over there in the tan overalls. All right. Thanks a lot, Hyde. Okay. Uh, your name Richard Morgan, is that right, sir? Yeah, that's right. Police officers, Mr. Morgan. This is Sergeant Romero. How are you? Hi, sir. My name's Friday. We're out of accident investigation. I'd like to talk to you about the accident that just happened here. Sure was a bad one. Hope you catch those kids. Didn't even slow down. I understand you witnessed the accident. wonder if you'd be kind enough to tell us what you saw. I was just closing up my nursery here. Just unlocked my car and was about to get in when I saw this car come shooting up Los Feliz there. Fast clip. Where were the two women? They were just stepping off the curb under the crosswalk over there. I could tell they didn't see the car. I yelled, honked my horn. Guess I wasn't quick enough. It was just off. Go on, Mr. Morgan. Well, the way that car hit those women looked to me like he knocked them 50 feet at least. Then, just like nothing at all, the car raced right on through the intersection on down Los Feliz, that way. Mm-hmm. Did you get a look at the driver? No, sir. Not too good, but I believe he had blonde hair. Looked to me like he was alone in the car. Mm-hmm. Anything more about him? Looked like a young kid to me. I'll bet on that. He was a young, blonde kid, about oh, 18, 19, around in there. Now, how about the car he was driving? Can you help us out there, sir? I believe it was a Ford. I don't know what year. Yeah, a Ford sedan, two-door. What color was it? Black. Dark blue. I'd say black. Uh-huh. Did you happen to get the license numbers? No, sir. Everything happened so fast, I guess I was kind of stunned for a minute. You know how you'd be. Sorry, wish I did. I mean, you're pretty sure about the car, Mr. Mortigan. Are you familiar enough with cars to be positive it was a Ford? Yeah, I think I am. And you don't know what year the car was? No, sir. Sorry, I don't. Just know it was a Ford sedan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Morgan. We may have to check back with you later. Anytime. we would better do whatever I can to help you get that driver. How can we get a hold of you, Mr. Morgan? Well, I'm right here at all times. Morgan Nurseries. 4402. Thank you very much. Those two old women, they didn't have a chance the minute they stepped off the curb. Crazy kid didn't even stop to see if he could help him. Yes, sir. Well, no. Didn't see him. Maybe it wasn't for before we left the scene of the accident, we interviewed the other two. They could add nothing to Richard Morgan. Investigation disclosed that number one was... Victim number two was identified as Elizabeth Ann Carey, age 65. Ben and I drove over to the Hollywood station where we met Officer Hyde, who was just completing his reports and was booking the physical evidence found at the scene of the accident. Included in the evidence were the top coats worn by the victims at the time they were struck down. All this was turned over to Lieutenant Lee Jones in the crime lab. Ben and I compiled the small amount of information that we had. The physical scene, 
and the scant information that the witnesses were able to give us. Not enough for us to attempt to identify the driver of the hit-and-run car. Well, it wasn't much to go on. P.M. We got a call from his investigation and wanted to see us right away. We were... No, we haven't gotten much of almost anything. All right. First off, your witness out there, what was his name? Morgan? Yeah, well, Morgan is right. The car was black. Then a microscopic analysis on scrapings found on the victim's coats. Yeah. I'd say a black car, previously painted tan or sand color under the black. That was one of the things he's positive about. How about the make and the models? Anything there? Is that too much to ask? I think maybe I can help you there, too. What's the break in? Let's see. Just got back from the lighthouse. Ran a lens meter test on those pieces of broken headlight lens, and the diopter reading shows that that particular type lens was made in 1934. Well, how about the make of the car, Lee? The only company that used this type of lens was the Ford Motor Company. Pretty positive about it? Ran a spectrographic test on the chemical composition of the glass in the lens. Checks out. Well, you got a car to work on. That's it, 1934 Ford Black. Oh, well, thanks a lot, Lee. It's all right. When you find the car, I can tie it in definitely for you. Well, that's fine. Oh, excuse me. I'm Lab Jones. They're right here, Mac. Just a minute. Do either one of you, Smith Dearman. I'll take you, Jim. Okay. Yeah, Max Romero. Oh, when? Yeah, me too. Yeah, right. Mac just got word from Georgia Street. Yeah. Both victims. They just died. <laughs> With the death of the two victims, what had only been a hit-and-run felony had now become a case of manslaughter, two counts. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Lieutenant McDearman. Past experience has proven to the traffic officer that the quickest and surest way to a successful prosecution of a hit-and-run case is with the full cooperation of the average citizen. A hit-and-run felony differs from the ordinary police case in that the investigating officers are not dealing with a criminal suspect. In a case of this nature, the guilty party could well be the outstanding citizen of his community. In all probability, he had no motive for a crime, only motive in running from the scene of the accident. Well, the one way to gain citizen cooperation was to acquaint him with all the details of the accident, any and all information that we had or would obtain as the case worked towards solution. 10.15 p.m., Saturday, September 5th. In addition to the emergency broadcast put out at the time of the accident, supplemental broadcasts and APBs were sent out. Ben and I then started to make up a special police bulletin. Wanted for manslaughter and hit and run felony. Okay. Uh, information regarding identity of occupant of following hit and run vehicle. Hmm. Regarding identity of occupant. Yeah. Vehicle. Okay. Got it? Mm hmm. Involved in accident resulting in death of two female pedestrians. Hmm. Accident. Accident occurred September 5th. Approximately what time, Joe? Uh, 7.30 p.m. Right. On Los Feliz Boulevard at intersection of Commonwealth Avenue. Okay. Can I see what we got? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Occupant, young male, Caucasian, approximately 18 to 19 years of age. Vehicle, 1934 Ford sedan. Black with tan undercoat, driven by male occupant. This car will have extensive damage to front end. Facsimile photographs of type of car wanted appear on this bullet. You got yeah. the photos right here. Side, front, and back view. Okay, this ought to do it. Let's get it down to the printing bureau right away, huh? Yeah, auto paint shops, wrecking yards, garages, repair stations. Used car lots, insurance company. The daily papers are running a spread on it in the next edition. That ought to cover it? Yeah, it's all there if it gets to the right person. Wednesday, September 9th, 10.45 a.m. The inquest of the two hit-and-run victims was held, and the jury returned a quick verdict of manslaughter, two counts, naming a John Doe as guilty. For the next three weeks, we received numerous phone calls concerning the black Ford sedan. All leads were checked out and failed to materialize. Cars fitting the description of the wanted vehicle were constantly being stopped and the occupants questioned. We got nowhere. Ben and I followed up on our bulletins. We checked various garages and paint shops. Used car lots were checked and rechecked. No luck. Monday, October 3rd, 2.30 p.m. We were on our way back to the office after having canvassed several wrecking yards and repair stations. I never knew they made so many black 34 Ford here. 
I don't see how we could have overlooked anything, you. No, I don't. Something ought to break on this thing soon. We just had a little more to go on. That license number, if somebody could have seen it. Yeah, that'd help, wouldn't it? Hmm? I'll get it. Traffic Friday. Hello, my name is Dan Provost. I run a used car lot in Dan's Corner at 54736 Avenue. Yes, sir. I'd like to talk to somebody regarding that last bulletin you sent out September 7th this year. Well, I think maybe I can help you, sir. That 34 Ford you're looking for on that hit and run thing? Yeah, that's right. That young kid, blonde, says he's got some repair work for us. Yeah. I got one of my mechanics stalling him now. What's the car look like, Mr. Provost? Like the one you're looking for. The reason I called is because he says he banged up the front end. Right away, I remember the bulletin. All right, sir, see if you can hold him there, will you? We'll be right over. I'll do my best. We'll be right there, sir. I think I've got your man for you. Took us to get to 50 for Dan's corner. We crossed over the gravel covered lot to the rear where we found it. I'm. Yes, sir, that's right. I'm sorry I did my best, but I couldn't hold him here without making him suspicious, but I'm sure he'll be back. How do you know? We see he bought this car from us, says he had a little accident and wanted us to fix it up for him. I told him we would if he'd bring it in. Why do you think he left? It's only been about 15 minutes since you called us downtown. Well, he might have heard me talking to you. Well, if he did, and he's our man, I doubt very much if he'll be back. I bet he will. Blonde kid, about 19 years old, driving a black 34 Ford, just like the one you're after. Well, can you give us his name and the license number of the car? Sure, it's Curly Watson. License number, I got it right here. 9R9707. I looked it up on his contract. And this name, Curly, you have his full name? <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm a little excited. It's uh, Wilfred E. Watson. Everybody around here calls him Curly. I'm pretty sure he's the one you want. I know that car. I bought it from us about five months ago. Well, it's just too bad you couldn't have detained him just a little longer, Mr. Provost. Well, like I say, you don't have to worry. He'll be back. What makes you so sure? From the way he described the damage to us, I'd say he's got about $75 to $100 worth of work on that front end. Yeah? I know he's the man you want. I'm going to be in trouble if he's not. What do you mean? What well, was the only thing I could do on the spur of the moment like that? Yeah. That's how I know for sure he'll be back here. Well, how's that? I told him I'd fix his car free. <laughs> You are in the forgery division of a Metropolitan Police Department. Handwriting analysis. All right, now write the alphabet in lowercase, please. You are listening to a handwriting expert taking an exemplar of a suspect's handwriting. Now write the numerals from 1 to 10, please. This handwriting sample will be compared with a forged signature. Side by side, two signatures may often look alike, but closer examination will prove a world of difference. You'll find the same is true when you compare king-size cigarettes. Fatimas are the same length as any other king-size cigarette, 85 millimeters. Fatima has the same circumference, one and one sixty-fourths inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as other king-size cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Fatima gives you extra mildness, a much different, much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So compare Fatima yourself. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Best of all, long cigarettes. We called Lieutenant McDermott and filled him in. He sent Sergeants Kilpatrick and McClendon out to relieve Ben and me and to maintain a stakeout on Dan's corner, the used car lot, in the event the suspect should return. We went back downtown to R&I. Wilfred E. Watson had a record and was wanted by the Fresno Police Department where he had jumped bail. The charge was grand theft. We took Watson's mugshot back to the used car lot where he was positively identified by Dan Provost. Ben and I went to his last known address. The landlady told us that Watson had moved approximately a month ago and had not left a forwarding address. From his mama sheet, we obtained a list of his friends and associates. All efforts to locate him failed. The stakeout continued. We showed the mugshot to Richard Mortigan, the one good witness to the accident. He said he could not identify Watson as he did not get too good a look at him, but he stated that there was a possibility that he could be the man. A week went by. The whereabouts of the suspect was still unknown. Tuesday, October 10th, Ben and I were out running down a lead on Watson when we received a call to return to the office. 
Lieutenant McDearman met us as we got there. Oh, I put that call in for you. Anything doing there? I got a lead. I don't know how good it'll be, but we ought to check it out right away. Well, what do you got? We just received a call from the Santa Monica PD. Uh-huh. Uh, Mrs. Agnes Hastings called in and gave him a little something. Yeah? As I say, maybe there's nothing in it, but see what you think. All right. Uh, the Hastings woman stopped in at a local soda fountain down there. The uh, place is patronized by the hot rod crowd. Mm-hmm. Said she overheard part of a conversation between a couple of the kids. Yeah. Uh, this one dark-haired boy was sitting at the counter when another kid walked in the front door. Uh, the kid that came in had red hair. The dark-haired kid said, hi, Red, and the redhead sat down by him. Yeah. And one of the kids made some remark about the boy's red hair, asked him why he dyed it. The redhead said, well, they're looking for a blonde, aren't they? Yeah. Could be a little something, huh? Yeah, I thought so. Then the Hastings woman followed the redheaded boy outside and took the license number of his car. Mm-hmm. Anything there? I don't know yet. Ran it through DMV, but it's not in the file. Mark Benson's got a call into Sacramento now. Anything new on Watson? No, nothing yet. Well, where can we find this Agnes Hastings, Max? Oh, here's the address right here. Okay, thank you. Well, that's all she had. Said she'd been following the hit-and-run story in the papers. Thought this might be worth forwarding anyway. Yeah. Well, just a minute. Mm-hmm. Traffic, McDermott. Oh, hi, Art. Yeah? Oh, you did, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, right. But That was Art Kilpatrick. He and McClendon picked up Watson. Yeah, anything? They're bringing him in now. They say this Watson denies the hit and run. Jones will check his car over, then we'll know a little more. Well, there's not much we can do till we hear from Benson on the Santa Monica thing. Well, maybe there is. What's that? We got two leads. We can hope one of them's right. While waiting for the call from Mark Benson at CHP, Ben and I drove over to the police garage on South Figueroa. Wilfred Watson's car had been impounded, and Lee Jones had made his investigation. His findings eliminated Watson's 34 Ford as being the hit-and-run car. Investigation showed that Watson's car was involved in an accident, but this was five days prior to the killing of the two women pedestrians. Wilfred E. Watson was booked for the Fresno authorities for prosecution on their warrant. This left only the one lead, the red-headed boy who had dyed his hair. If Agnes Hastings' observations had been correct, the fact that the boy originally had blonde hair made him a possible suspect. 11 a.m. The information from DMV came through from Sacramento. The car was registered to a Calvin L. Martin, 16 Boardwalk Lane, Santa Monica. The car was a 1939 Dodge sedan, legal the same. 16 Boardwalk Lane was a small beach house facing out on the Pacific Ocean in the town of Santa Monica. 11.26 a.m. We arrived in front of the house. This is it, number 16. Yeah, all right, let's go up on the porch. Mm-hmm. I don't see anybody around. Looks like nobody's home. Well, let's try the bell. Mm-hmm. I guess you're right. Nobody home. Yeah. Let's check the garage, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the side, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's right there. Oh, yeah. Padlock. Uh, maybe there's a window around the side. Uh-huh. Yeah. Come here, Joe. All right. Window's kind of dirty. I'll wipe it off a little. Yeah, that's better, huh? Can you see me? Take a look, Joe. Let me see. Yeah. Looks like a 34 Ford to me. Notice the left front fender? Yeah. Pretty badly dented, isn't it? Hmm. Looks like we're home, maybe, huh? I'd like to get a closer look. Hey, come on, Sid. See you back here, huh? Sure. Any time you found one, sir? Okay. Young kid got out of a car out front. Looks like a redhead from here. Come on. Hi. You men want something? Police officers. Yeah. Do you live here? Yes, I do. What's wrong? What's your name? Louis Martin. Who is Calvin L. Martin? My father, why? Does he own a 1939 Dodge? Yeah, that's right. Anything wrong? Whose car is that down in the garage there? Belongs to a friend of mine. I just let him keep it in there. What's his name? Jesse. Yeah, well, Jesse what? Jesse Armstrong. Where does he live? 
Over on Dennis Boulevard. What's the number? I don't know offhand. And you let him park his car here in your garage and you don't know where he lives? Well, I know, but I just can't think of it. I don't understand. What's wrong? You got a key to the garage? No, Jesse's got it. You don't keep a key to your own garage? No, I let Jesse keep it. Have you always had red hair? Sure. Why? Red on top and blonde at the roots. Is that it? I wish you'd tell me what's going on. No, Armstrong, you tell us. Well, good luck to Joe. All right, all right. Let's hold it right here. I didn't do anything. Let me go. Well, how about it, son? That's the second time you tried to run now, isn't it? How'd you find me? Who told you? You want to tell us about it? I didn't mean to hit those two women. I was coming home from up in L.A. I was late, and I was trying to hurry to get home. I, I didn't see him until it was too late. Why didn't you stop? Why'd you run? I, I was afraid. I, I just couldn't face it. I th thought I could get away with it, I guess. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. You know those two old women died as a result of you running them down? No. I didn't know they'd die. <laughs> All right, come on, son. Let's go. I didn't really mean to do it. I'll tell everybody I'm sorry. I am sorry. That'll make a difference, won't it? You kill two people. You figure it. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 17th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 81, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, I can give you over a dozen good reasons why Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes, but I'd rather let Fatima speak for itself. That's why I suggest that you buy a pack tomorrow. And then compare Fatima with any other long cigarette. You'll find, just as I have... Fatima's extra mildness gives you a much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Ask your dealer for Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. The suspect, Louis T. Martin, was found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to one year in the county jail and was placed on probation for five years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counterspy next over most NBC stations.